My name is Douglas Wood. I'm the Chief Executive of Surface Mutual Holdings and also a founding member of the Auxilia Society of Zimbabwe and its past president. Okay. Uh, anyway, like I said before, thank you again for having this, uh, taking the time to talk to me. Um, the first question I wanted to ask you is a very pertinent one, considering where we are today. Um, how do you see the current cash crisis in the country in relation to uh, financial sector growth, as someone who's in that space? Thank you for that question. I think my first uh, answer, or the first part of my answer, that is to say, why do we have a cash crisis? Because that will lead to the, toward the, its effect on the financial sectors. From where I sit, the reason for the cash crisis is the lack of trust between the citizens and the state actors. The announcement of a policy measure cannot suddenly result in a bigger demand for cash, all things being equal. Mm. So people are, don't trust the intention of government with the introduction of bond notes, so they are hedging their bets and saying, well, let me take my money from the bank and keep it somewhere else, it will have more value when this bond notes come. Uh, at home? Yeah. Be here. Now when you look at that, uh, this is what is called disintermediation in economic terms. Mm. It means it removes money from the banks where it is supposed to be used on an aggregate basis to finance various activities in the economy that makes the economy work. That's for the economy in general. When you look at the financial sector, it is the waste affected by this because the financial sector mm. does not sell tangible products. Mm. It sells trust. Mm. So when the speed of trust is as low as it has become, the financial sector becomes a victim immediately. Um, my next question, um, considering that the financial sector is going to be uh, worst affected by this current cash, cash crisis, um, when you look at the current economic conditions which are making the situation worse around uh, this, this current issue which the country is facing right now, um, how do you think companies or uh, finance companies, fi companies in that space, the financial sector, can work around these conditions? Well, thank you for that. I think the companies in the financial sector are affected by the environment, but the call of leadership at any point in time is to do with the emerging environment. So from where I sit, I think that the the financial sector companies must interact with the clients and mm. tell them why they should keep on putting money into pensions, putting money into health insurance, putting money into mm. funeral insurance. In other words, we still need to be able to give the value proposition. Mm. And to my mind, we should sell the more effectively why we exist is, is like for, for my group as an insurance company, mm. which is the whole ethos of providing economic dignity mm. to our stakeholders. And I think that we should show by evidence that despite the problems associated with bond notes and the insecurity, the promise of benefits in our products is being paid today. Mm -hmm. uh, because that is the very test of who we are. We should also be seen to be ourselves in the way we conduct ourselves to be cognizant of the fact that things are difficult for our clients. So we should lead by example and also live modest, modestly. Okay. Uh, as, as the players to so that it's congruent with the emerging economic setup. I also further believe that we can uh, educate our stakeholders. This is not the first time that Zimbabwe has had a crisis of confidence. It happened in hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. we, we, we should take lessons from that past as financial sector players mm -hmm. to say if this is obtaining, where should we invest the new money? Mm -hmm. Which assets can outlive the life of bond notes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need to tell our clients our belief about assets that may live the, outlive the, the lifespan of bond notes. Mm -hmm. And to my mind, that speaks of buying real assets. So we're likely to see more investments into property. 
and into shares. The shares will not immediately give a value now, but if you are holding shares of a company, by the time we have a better economy, mm. there will be a rebound. Monetary assets, which can become equal to bond notes, not likely to be very popular. Okay. Um, is it not wise then that uh, maybe the companies in the financial sector space should start accepting a currency which is more readily available to do their business? Uh, case in point, the rent. Yeah, there's been considerable national debate about why the US is not the land or bond notes. I don't think there's any, any relationship between the suggestion about bond notes in the use of runs. Because as you may be aware, in the multi currency basket, the runs are there. That's correct. So we can't say let's use runs, we're already using them. But what one would, on reflection, one, mm. what one would mm. say is that in any setup, where you put the US dollar together with other currencies, it takes a champion position or four position. Therefore, as, as far as we are concerned, it's legal to be trading in runs. You can buy runs, you can withdraw runs from the ATMs, you can withdraw runs from the banks. But the reality is that whilst we have this multi currency system, in practice, we have a dollar environment. The national budget itself is done in dollars. Taxes, revenue are done in dollars. Mm. So it would be a miss to think that just for people to get cash they must get it in runs when everything else that we are doing as a country is actually measured in US dollars. And there's no question about that the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. So mm. we, we, we should be trying to address what the real problem is rather than to think what currency we use. Mm. So I wouldn't believe myself that using grants would necessarily resolve the matter. But what would be instructive from your question is that it's often easier for countries in the same region to have a similar currency because the conditions are nearly the same. South Africa is a much bigger economy than the rest of the SADAC. So in normal life, we should have fitted into the land monetary union. That would have been a good thing to do. So that would still be done, but there are necessary and sufficient conditions which we have to meet in terms of targets of the performance of government before the Central Bank of South Africa can accept our own new currency as part of its currencies. If you take places like Namibia, Swaziland, Lesotho, some extent Botswana, although they are dealing with the plus of the run now, they have the Elang Yen in Swaziland, the Namibian dollar, which is only one to one with the run. Those countries have to, they don't have a functional central bank because the, that, the role of the central bank will be done in South Africa, in the Reserve Bank in Tutorial. And you, you need to have the rest of the economic fundamentals like inflation, government expenditure, deficits, similar to that. Otherwise, you create a, an opportunity for risk free profits between the two currencies, which is undesirable. Okay. Um, so, with that said, what kind of uh, financial innovations are needed uh, in Zimbabwe's economy? My thinking is that we need to be honest with each other, starting from the politicians and ask the business and address the problem that we have. Zimbabwe was on its way to recover very well mm. using dollars. So the innovation we need is more at the governance level, mm. not the products. We, we have to increase the speed of trust between the citizens and the state actors and between the citizens and business. Because it's not just the state actors. What you find is companies make profit and they want to ship it out of the country mm. in the middle of the night. So in other words, we should be believing what we tell the rest of the citizens. And the example that I give you today is myself as a chief executive officer. If I'm withdrawing all my cash from the bank and putting it under my pillow, but I'm asking my clients to, to deposit their money with my business, what business am I giving across? We need the leaders of business and government to, to come up in the bank and say they are still investing in Zimbabwe. They have money in Zimbabwe bank accounts. They believe that the economy will recover and that problem will come down the next. Okay. That's my issue. So, uh, with that said, uh, it brings me to my, my next question. So why does there seem to be a huge disconnect between the financial sector players and government? Why do you always seem to be uh, at, at loggerheads, as, so to speak? I think that there is, is a lack of uh, honest conversation. In our industry, for example, the, the sub, insurance subsidy of the financial sector, we don't have a big disconnect with the government because we actually tell them the truth. There seems to be something going on between the banks and the central bank, which I don't understand. Mm. Yeah, because 
the we expect that a new policy cannot just be announced without consulting the stakeholders. Mm. Because right now there's no doubt that even the president knows that people do not vote most so in doubt. Mm. The sentiment is very apparent. Mm. Villagers from Ramlina or Tito or Usma Maram don't want board notes. So why do you do such a thing? So that that's I think that is the leadership now not connecting with even ordinary citizens, never mind the financial sector players. But at least one day they thought that the current consultation going on between the central bank, the churches, industry and commerce should have been done prior to the announcement. Because the damage is already done. Confidence levels have plummeted. We are trying to do damage control. And if you consider that uh, the board notes are only set to be coming in October, there was enough time to consult first before announcing anything. Because there's still a four month lead time from where you are today. Yeah, and then the, the, we, the, we were hearing reports that actually people have taken the opportunity to withdraw even faster. Yes, because they don't the, 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 again because they lost their trust. So I think that trust must be built on accountability. The, discon the connection must be on sharing a common destiny. Mm. What, this, what happened in this country because of hyperinflation it created a speculative tendency across the whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. So you'll be you will be surprised that the same people are saying don't need to draw your money, the financial centers safe like me, as one leader. I'm probably going during the night and getting my money out and asking you to keep your safe. So that is the lack of connection which we have. We are not all seeing from the same song sheet. Too much selfishness, everybody's trying to build their own nest. But because we are taking feathers from each other, this nest is never going to be built. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my last question probably, um, uh, there's been fear that with the controls RBZ have been putting in place, the 1,000 cap, the withdrawals, uh, uh, exporters must submit 50% of their receipts to RBZ, um, let's say only have smaller denominations, now it's very hard to find a $100 note. Um, I know the bankers, Miss, uh, Mrs. Jinga, uh, BAZ president, you remember recently at the uh, Politburo, at uh, one of these committees, Parliament was advocating that we need smaller denominations. We can expect that in the future. Um, when we had the multi currency system in 2009, it kind of opened the financial sector, it made it an open thing so people were able to, to do more. And it, as you said, it put us on a road to recovery. But now it seems like the RBZ putting these controls. We're now becoming a closed market. And of course, the first people who are going to get impacted by that is your, your sector, the financial sector. What do you think of these controls the RBZ have put in place? Well, this is very basic, like what I call kindergarten economics. There's evidence, empirical and practical, that command economies failed. History, they speak for itself. Communism, as you would know tried to survive in the Soviet Union for 60 years and it failed. Mm. From 1917 to 1989, 72 years collapsed. Mm. And it was being imposed on citizens by force to be arrested if you do that. So there's ample evidence to suggest that a free market economy creates better opportunities for individuals to self-actualize and to create more value for everybody. I think that the, the plans are very negative. The government said it doesn't want controls, but it's putting them in place. Yeah. So that's, that's a self-contradiction. So to my mind, the controls are not the answer. We need more accountability. We need more transparency, both from business and government. And we need to increase the speed of trust between the citizens, ordinary, and the leadership, both in government and in the private sector. You have yet instances of private sector companies where employees go for months of being paid, but the management is paid over the month. That again is where the disconnection comes. So we in the leadership we have to lead in a way that is the way we treat ourselves must be the same way we treat our employees and our stakeholders. If we do that, I'm backed by a theme of creating economic dignity. We will be able to preserve ourselves as a in my in particular case as our sector. Because what we what we need to do, we need the people who are insured the first neutral wealth or health or whatever it is. When they fall sick, they must arrive at this clinic and get treated. But if we continue not to 
put controls and they are not acting. The hospital is full. There are, there are no other things that you use that the doctors want to receive board notes that economic deal falls apart. So we need everybody, all ends on death, starting with the politicians, followed by the business. The rest of the citizens of this country are good people, as far as I'm concerned. It's the leadership which is the problem. And that's not just government. It's also the leadership in the, in the private sector. It's also the leadership in my profession. And I'm going to be talking about that more in my presentation. To say, as a profession, how do we promote and sustain economic dignity? What actions do we take to make sure that we make our own contribution to the creation of economic dignity, even in a difficult economic environment like ours? That's my story. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Otto, for your time <laughs> and speaking to me. Uh, we just hope that there will be some improvement. <laughs> yeah,